right. I am happy to be joined with Jim Gilligan, who is the president and chief scientific officer of Trip Therapeutics, along with Dr. Jennifer Miller, professor of pediatrics and endocrinology at the University of Florida, and also principal research investigator currently going on phase two clinical trials that Trip Therapeutics is currently conducting. Dr. Miller, Jim, thanks for joining me this morning. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Jen. Jim, you're uh, still in New Jersey, and Dr. Miller, I'm sure you're loving the sun, obviously, down in Florida. Um, how are you guys both making out, obviously, with lifestyle, COVID and everything, and I hope you're staying safe with everything. We're all back to normal here. Everybody's coming in person again, and we're all vaccinated, so <laughs> we're good. I've, I've had both my shots, so I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm good. Oh, I'm envious, uh, envious of both of you, so uh, we got to get doing that, obviously, here up in Canada. But uh, listen, I wanted to have both have you on here today to talk about the research and development and get a better understanding as to what's being conducted. Um, I first wanted to actually touch base with you, Jim, obviously knowing that Dr. Harris is Dr. Robin Kahart Harris is an advisor to Trip Therapeutics and talk about the important research study that came out last week of the New England Journal of Medicine comparing psilocybin to acetylopram, obviously, for major depressive order that was released back on April 14th. Uh, the public was presented data comparing the efficacy of psilocybin to a conventional pharmaceutical drug on an apples to apples basis, but wanted to ask what were your thoughts of it all? And uh, what do you think this means for the overall industry pertaining to psilocybin and the trials that you're currently conducting? You know, it's, it's very interesting. Some people will look at it and just look at the, the minor differences that they saw between the two. And I think it, it goes much beyond that. Robin uh, Carhart Harris, as we know, is a pioneer in the psychedelic field. And what he was able to show was that with, with two interventions, with psilocybin, he was able to maintain uh, uh, an actual better effect. And part of what happened is he looked at a number of different variables. And what was interesting in every instance, the, the patient's uh, response on psilocybin was maybe not statistically significantly better, but better. And this just goes to what we're hoping to see when we talk with Dr. Miller about intervention with a psychedelic that has a profound effect um, on a patient. And this is something you and I discussed before, Shad, yeah. is that, you know, with these chronic conditions, if, if we can come up with a treatment paradigm where it's intermittent a couple of times a year versus daily dosing, I think it's a, a tremendous advantage for the patients. I think that's something so important for people to understand. Dr. Miller, I wanted to obviously have you on here today to get a real understanding about what's being conducted, uh, the research that's being conducted at the University of Florida. Important to share that psilocybin research is not only focusing on major depressive disorder, but also other neurological conditions, including eating disorders. There are a lot of stigmas around eating disorders, which of course impacts quality of life and self-esteem. So let's try to get a better understanding and break some of the stigmas down. If I'm someone that is dealing with an eating disorder on a day-to-day -day basis, how do I get to this point and what does my day-to-day -day life look like? So what the research we're actually going to be doing at the University of Florida with psilocybin is focusing on a little bit more intense problems than just eating disorders. Ultimately, of course, we hope it will help people with, with overall eating disorders. Yeah. Um, but first, we're going to focus on people with specific um, neurologic causes of those eating disorders, primarily is something called hyperphagia, where they just never feel full. So they are constantly wow. wanting to eat. And wow. so, um, so that's what our research is going to focus on is people with these conditions, either with um, a genetic condition called Prader-Willi syndrome, um, and also primarily in a group um, with hypothalamic obesity, which is usually caused by removal of a brain tumor that disrupts the circuits in the brain that affect appetite and satiety. And then also people with binge eating disorder, which we know has a neurologic basis as well. Hmm. So at what point do people go through an eating disorder and reach out for help? Like, is there a particular catalyst that brings them through the door for treatment that's needed? It's really when it's just uncontrollable. Yeah. Right. So these people we're going to study in this first in this first two a study are people who just simply cannot control their eating. Um, they'll eat out of the garbage. They'll eat out of dumpsters. They'll eat uh, what you know anything they can steal. They will eat pet food. They'll eat it, literally anything. Any you know lotions and toothpaste that smell good. They'll eat. You know. So um, so they are just literally starving. So um, although you know their body is obese as a result of the eating. So I guess we've gotten to a point where let's like take a look at how treatment options for eating disorders have evolved. Like what mistakes, I guess, have we learned from the past and where does treatment stand currently? 
and what does the future hold in terms of the help and treatment that's needed? So, I mean, I don't know that there were necessarily any mistakes in the past um, so much as just, you know, sort of a reliance on medications, you know, as you were talking with Jim about earlier about having to take medications daily, all of the currently available um, approved obesity and eating disorder medications are daily medications. You stop taking them you stop having the efficacy. And our hope is with psilocybin, you know, as Jim mentioned, once or twice a year treatments, hopefully will then, you know, allow these neural networks to rewire themselves and provide a more chronic treatment, which doesn't exist right now. And for these people with these rare disorders that we're going to study in this first trial, there is no treatment that exists right now, nothing, none of the currently available treatments or even past available treatments touch their, their appetite and fullness, not at all. I mean, everybody pretty much responded to FenFen, right? You know, even though it was, you know, it had cardiovascular effects and was pulled, but people were very successful on it, not these people. It didn't do anything um, in terms of their appetite. Jim, where did, where did the whole idea, I guess, of this research begin and uh, the relationship that was obviously established with the Uni University of Florida and more importantly with Dr. Uh, Miller? So I think what, what from trip to strategic concept was that we need to find the, the absolute uh, key, key opinion leaders, key researchers in the field. And so that brought us uh, to Dr. Miller, who fortunately agreed to work with us. So our idea was if you find people who have worked in the field, in the area with the patients, they, they know much better than yeah. we do. So what trip is supplying is the psychedelic expertise as a complement. And what we feel is that we're building the best possible team. We take luminaries in the field, such as Dr. Miller, in, in eating disorders and pair with, with TRIP, and we think that gives us the best likelihood of a positive outcome. That's interesting, to say the least. Um, wanted to ask as well, and this may be a question for both of you, um, as the topic of psilocybin continues to garner more and more attention, what are you hearing within the medical field? Like, when cannabis came on, you spoke to a lot of MDs, and they're like, more research needs to be provided. There's a lot of research that's obviously being conducted, and I don't want to compare psychedelics to cannabis, but from an investment standpoint, they just interlocked with each other. However, that's where all the comparisons end. What's the idea? What's the feedback that you're receiving in your own respective medical fields, the feedback that you're receiving from your peers? And um, is there excitement? Is there a lot of momentum, interest that's uh, beginning to, uh, you know, grow more and more as this, uh, you know, research is, it sounds promising so far, but we'll start with you, Dr. Miller. So I would say there's a lot of excitement in the field um, for, for this psychedelic research because, as I mentioned, nothing exists right now that, that helps these individuals at all. And so, you know, for something like this to potentially help them is, is a huge boon to the endocrine, you know, community because we really, all we can do is manage symptoms and we cannot, you know, effectively treat the problem that's the underlying problem. And so this provides that opportunity to treat the underlying problem. And so people are very excited. I would say that they're just as skeptical as they were when cannabis came down the line, you know, yeah. um, in terms of the fact that it is, you know, a controlled substance and they all feel that more research needs to be done and whatever. But I do think that people are excited about the possibility. Yeah. Jim, are you hearing the same thing? Yeah, and I, th I think what's happening, you know, just, you know, as you said, Rob Robin's uh, publication in New England Journal of Medicine just shows that people are starting to do rigorous science. And, and when, we when we spoke with Dr. Miller originally, we went in with what's the scientific principles, why we think that this could have a benefit. And it, it goes back to what, what something Dr. Miller said about the neural origin, the, the CNS origin of this disease, right? The dysfunction is in the brain. And so what we're not taking uh, a standard pharmacologic approach for treating symptoms. We're actually trying to go in and 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 address something that might be cor corrected. And again, as as we've mentioned to you, that this is a, a, a approach where we integrate uh, the, the psilocybin with psychotherapy in in order to try to address what's causing the problem. And I think that, that approach is different. And and. That goes for other areas where psychedelics are being uh, uh, explored, where you go to the, the actual origin of the problem and try to correct that, not just treat the symptoms. In the event that, you know, obviously you're looking to achieve um, successful results, successful trials to obviously more options for people that are enduring a lot of this, um, regardless of market size, uh, if everything proves successful, what would that mean as a company as a whole? And obviously research for you as well, Dr. Miller and Jim, we'll start with you. 
So I think what we're looking at is exploring the, the potential, the clinical potential for psilocybin in a number of different areas. And um, this particular area with Dr. Miller, we think um, represents just, just such an opportunity. And what we'd like to be able to do is in a way demystify, which sounds yeah. a little bit for a psychedelic, but demystify. Reality. Yeah, exactly, Chad. And and to show, look, it, there's good there, there's good clinical data. There, there's good reason to believe that there's an opportunity to do this. And I think the more groups that have a success across the spectrum, uh, the, the better off we're going to be. And um, I think it, the entire approach will be better accepted. Mm-hmm. And right, as Dr. Miller said, sure, there's some skepticism because of, of the history of, of psilocybin. But the more groups like University of Florida and Imperial College that, that do cutting edge research, get involved and provide data, that, that's what clinicians like, like Dr. Miller need because they're like, hey, this, this is real. Yeah. Here's data. We see a real benefit. And this is something we want to pursue. I have to ask you, Dr. Miller, within your field, where are we, you think, pertaining to a lot of these alternative medicines within the next two to three years? Is it tough? Oh, to- well, yeah. In the next two to three years, I think there's potential. I think we are still in our infancy in, in the general yeah. medical community. Um, I do think there's still a lot of skepticism about alternative medical therapies, for yeah. sure. What's it like, I guess, showing up every day? Obviously, you're doing an alternative medicine that's probably different from, you know, historically within your field. But uh, what's some of the feedback that you receive amongst your peers? Um, Like I said, I think people are very excited about it. Um, You know, there's just not anything that works right now. And so anything that we can do that would potentially would help these individuals, I think there's, you know, the, the hope is there for these, you know, for other physicians in the community. But like I said, there is, there is still a lot of skepticism about it. And, and, you know, the question of how it will work, will it work, you know, is still obviously there. But the nice thing about working with TRIP is that, you know, they've been really super agreeable to making sure that we have hard and fast scientific outcome measures as well, in addition to just, you know, things like their appetite rating scales and, and, you know, um, how they feel and how they're eating and their weight. Um, We're looking at, at measures of connectivity of the neural networks in the brain before and after psilocybin treatment. We're looking at a variety of hormonal indicators that, that influence appetite and fullness. So it's been great working with them because they've been very open to making sure that the, the study is done with scientific rigor and um, that there's really good outcome measures that are scientific in nature. When you talk you know, about, it, sorry, did you want to say something, Jim? Yeah, Chad, the other thing I would say, and it's overlooked and, and um, we take for granted, one of the, the other benefits of dealing with uh, psilocybin is its known safety profile. So from Dr. Miller's perspective, when she's dealing with patients that she's known forever, she has a a, a personal relationship with, she realizes that what she's going to administer has a good safety record. And when you have new chemical entities or new drugs, I'm not saying that they don't have it, but they don't have the history of safety that we have here. So there's this comfort level that do no harm, right? Dr. Miller, at least we that we're not going to put put the patients at a disadvantage. And so I think that that's, it's a subtle thing, but I think it's also important from a patient perspective as well. It truly is. And we've got patients lined up wanting to do this study actually. So if that tells you anything about, you know, the fact the safety record and, and uh, you know, the really excitement about the trial. Yeah, that is interesting to say at least. I wanted to ask too with you, Dr. Miller, is that you've talked about how it's been great to work with TRIP. When you speak to the investment community, one of the key features amongst TRIP is their executive boards and the wealth of experience they have within the pharmaceutical world. Are there any examples that you can provide my viewers as to like when you say it's great working with them, but the level of expertise that they bring to the table? And I'm not trying to blow up your ego here, uh, Jim, but (laughs) I'm just going to tell Dr. Miller, be nice. now. (laughs) But it's, it's crucial because a lot of times there's like important questions you need to ask about, you know, making an important investment within specific companies in the space. But what also needs to be asked are what are the important questions that you need to ask pertaining to the medical side of it all? And as we learn more and more, we're in the early stages of this. um, What are some of some key components or examples that you can provide where it is, you know, um, an advantage or uh, it has been, you know, a great experience so far working with the team that has a wealthy uh, knowledge and experience in the big pharma world? 
Uh, it, I can give you a perfect example. When they first approached me about potentially doing this, um, you know, I had some skepticism about some of, you know, the trial data and some of the participants in the trial. And, you know, I spoke to the entire company, including the CEO by Zoom and, you know, presented my concerns and they, you know, very appropriately addressed my concerns um, and, and provided literature and that kind of stuff. And, it, and they were super receptive to anything I suggested in terms of patient population population that would be ideal for this yeah. trial and um, and again you know outcome measures that would be good for this trial so it's it really has been a very positive experience that I can honestly say I've not ever worked with a company with this degree of experience in the pharma industry and that can easily sort of see from a researcher perspective like what's doable what's not doable what's you know you know yeah. where the concerns lie that kind of thing so it's been it's been invaluable great Jim did you want to add anything to that yeah, I think that when we approach this again, the reason we want to work with Dr. Miller, she's an expert. And, yeah. and so that, that's the first thing. And if you bring on an expert, you value their opinion. And I think uh, Dr. Miller would, would agree that it's been very collaborative. And we bring in certain levels of expertise when we bring in psychotherapists or people who can help. And she brings in her considerable expertise and experience with, with the patients. And so that's what you know, I've said this to you before, Chad, right? You know, the football team, best we have to have different players to, to, to have a great team. Right. And that's the way we look at it. We're in the best, the best players for this team. And it, it's great when you look forward to having these meetings. And we genuinely look forward to having these meetings with Dr. Miller and her group because it's exciting. And we're making a lot of progress at, 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 literally every week in our discussions going forward. One of the questions I know you both probably cannot stand is timelines everybody wants to know timelines but you know at the end of the day <laughs> and i know you want to you know be be off of that but uh as far as managing expectations is it anything you want to even touch on because the question gets asked over and over all the time but realistically and i know i asked this question before where are we within this space in the next couple of years but um how do you respond to that when people ask those types of questions jim Oh, I think we got froze there. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this. So part of what people understand, understand is that this is a, it's a regular day, but you know, we have to deal with the DEA. Yeah. And then there's certain things that we, we control, uh, preparing the IND, work with Dr. Miller in finalizing the protocol, having the protocol go through what's called an IRB. So we're, we're doing very well controlling our components of the program. And we, we have a time frame where we'll be submitting the IND, you know, within a relatively short period of time, within months. Yeah. And then it's up to the regulators and the DEA. But uh, again, this is a perfect example of collaboration. When we talk with Dr. Miller's group, they have someone who has experience with the DEA, who's assisting us with right. going the bureaucracy because it's a schedule one drug and so it's it's a little bit more complex than standard clinical studies and that's another great example of how we're working together by providing each other the data so that we can advance the program that is a very important note indeed listen i know you're both busy i really appreciate you taking the time to catch up with us i applaud both of the uh you know uh commitments that you're making for more alternatives and opportunities for people that are going through these conditions but most importantly we appreciate you taking the time to connect with us here today thank you so much all right thanks dr miller thanks jim